Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our virtual wine tasting with Penn's Woods. Uh, I'm Devin Zuchek. I'm the president of the Penn State Brandywine Alumni Society. Um, I'm going to be brief because I know everyone's probably zoomed out of their minds by now uh, throughout the pandemic. Um, but this one, you get to sit back and enjoy the wine tasting that we have lined up for you. Um, this event benefits the Penn State Brandywine Food Pantry, uh, which provides services such as food pickup and gift card assistance and is available to all students experiencing food insecurity like many Pennsylvanians during this time. So I just wanna thank all of you who purchased a wine tasting pack benefiting the food pantry. And if you missed out on a sample pack or just following along at home, uh, we encourage you to support the food pantry and either donate using the link in the chat that I'll post. Um, or if you purchase wine from Penn's Woods, um, mention this event within the next seven days and 10% uh, of your purchase will go towards our food pantry fundraising. Um, and if you'd like to, if you are interested in participating uh, in the Penn State Brandywine Alumni Society. Um, I'll post a link as well where you can get more information. Uh, but that's it for me. Uh, so thanks for joining us. Uh, we can get started um, and I'll pass it over to Rachel who's gonna lead uh, the tasting today. Sorry to cut you off real qu quick, Rachel. One thing I forgot to mention is that we are recording this um, just so everyone's aware uh, and it will be available to um, watch later for attendees. So if you miss something or whatever, um, we are recording. Great, that's a good idea. <laughs> All right, how's everybody doing tonight? Good. Good? <laughs> Woo! Ready to drink some wine, have some fun. Um, well, for those of you, um, well, I guess none of you know me because I've never met any of you before. Um, I am Rachel Kewen. I am our sommelier and sales manager at Penn's Woods Winery. We're in Chad's Ford, PA, um, not too far from Penn State Brandywine. So if y'all live in the area, you should definitely come and visit. Um, just as I get going throughout this thing, you know, I know um, if you might have questions or comments. I'll ask you, you know, what's your favorite, what you're thinking. So go ahead and you can unmute yourselves um, at will and let me know what you're thinking. Um, we can have a fun time chatting with each other. Um, I'm very excited to be here. I really appreciate you guys were reaching out to do this virtual event with us. It's super awesome for you to be supporting local businesses like Locust Lane, like Penn's Woods. It means a lot to us, especially in the last year that we've had, as I'm sure you all have had too. It was pretty rowdy. Anyway, enough of that. Um, for those of you who haven't been to Penn's Woods before, I'm just going to give you like a little brief overview about who we are, what we do and why we do it. Just um, give you a little background. So um, our owner and winemaker is Gino Razzi. Um, he is from Italy. He came over from Abruzzo in the 60s, um, went to college, served in the United States Marine Corps, went to Vietnam, and then came back and founded a wine import company with his brother Nino. I know Gino and Nino, it's pretty cute. Um, and they've been doing that for the last 40 some odd years, but you don't spend as much time in the wine industry as he has without getting the winemaking bug a little bit yourself. So in the nineties, he started making wine in Italy. Um, his very first vintage, uh, his Montepulciano di Abruzzo symposium in 97 got 95 points from wine spectator. He has definitely has a gift for making wine and made a few vintages there in Italy, but he was living in PA importing wine, European wine here, but thinking like, man, look at all this beautiful farmland. Um, there's a handful of people just at the time growing grapes here and just thinking like they're making kind of wine with no purpose, wine with no finesse, a lot of fruit wines and hybrids and things like that. And just thinking, wow, I really feel like Pennsylvania has a lot of potential um, to make premium wine here in PA. And so he founded Penn's Woods Winery in 2001. Um, so that makes this year actually our 20 year anniversary roaring 20s. Here we go. Um, and he started, uh, at first he started by purchasing locally grown grapes um, and just to kind of experiment, but so much about what you experience in wine is important with how it's grown. And he wanted to be more involved from everything from literally the ground up. So in 2004, he purchased our first vineyard site, um, which is our Chadsford Vineyard. It was Smithbridge Winery. And they planted a lot of their vines in the late 70s and early 80s. So actually our current vineyard, we're sitting on some 40 plus year old vines making very, very beautiful wine, including 
something I'm really excited to talk about and appear in a bit, our Chardonnay. Um, but we've grown so much since then. Um, originally, it was about seven acres planted. Currently, we have about 15 acres planted at our Chad's Ford Vineyard. We have another 25 acres planted in Coatesville, and we're planting an additional um, just under 10 acres at a third vineyard site here in a couple of weeks. So we are growing. It is super exciting. And um, our Chad's Ford Vineyard, um, we have a tasting room, overlooks it. It's so beautiful if you ever want to come over and hang out. But enough of that. Let's drink some wine. Um, so you have your little tiny bottles. I just want to um, kind of give you like a little overview about how I approach wine tasting. I'm sure some of you have done wine tasting, beer tasting, things like that before. Um, but I like to kind of approach tasting wine, what I call the five S's. It's kind of using all of your senses to experience wine. That way you can get down to all the nitty gritty details, experience all those nuances of aroma and flavor. Um, anyway, the five S's, the first one is C. So much of what you um, can initially tell from wine is just what you can visually see in the glass. So if you pour your Chardonnay into your glass, you can go in there and see it. If it's a white wine, is it lighter colored? Is it more yellow? Um, that can indicate some oak aging on a white wine. For a red wine, is it more translucent? Is it darker? It's going to give you a little information. If it's lighter bodied, if it's more full bodied, and there are exceptions. Um, but in general, you know, you can kind of impress your friends later down the road if you pour like a Pinot Noir and a Cabernet and you can just be like blind like oh that's Pinot because it's always light and bright and you can almost see through it and Cab is um, much deeper darker and richer um, so that's the first S the second one is swirl this one is super important so when you get that wine in your glass you want to swirl it around that wine's been hanging out in the bottle you need to aerate it and introduce oxygen it's going to release all those beautiful little esters so you can get wonderful aroma that leads to the third one, which is smell. So much about what you experience on your palate um, also is linked to your sense of smell. It's linked to your memory. And when you, you can kind of do an experiment where you kind of close your nose and taste your wine, and then you take a deep inhale and then taste your wine and it opens so much more on the palate. Um, it's really, really exciting to kind of and a fun thing to do. So if I see any of you closing your nose, you know, if you want to give it a whirl. Um, and then the next one is sip. That's just your initial instinctual impression. What's going on? Is this light? Is this bright? Is this fruity? Is this earthy? And the last one is savor. That's when you take that sip and you let it hang out on your taste buds, swirl it around and kind of do that fancy sommelier thing where they like go and like swish it around in there. You get you have so many different taste buds in all parts of your mouth, not just your tongue. There's underneath, there's different ones in the front to the back and your cheeks here up in your gums. Um, and you can experience different um, flavors in different parts of your mouth. So it's important to kind of let it sit, sit in there for just a minute before you sling it back and drink it. Um, so again, that's kind of how I approach drinking wine. You can do whatever you like, but just some, you know, hot tips. So our first wine we're going to get into is our Chardonnay Reserve 2019. Beautiful wine. Um, like I said, it's one of our original plantings there in the vineyard. So these vines are over 40 years old. They're super gorgeous. I should probably like uh, bring some pictures when I do these things, but they're like super twisted and knotted and gnarled and just very deep root systems. Older vines produce fewer clusters of grapes, so they have more concentration of flavor in those fewer clusters. And that's why, you know, everyone brags about like an old vine wine. That's why more flavor. Um, but Chardonnay, I'm sure you all have, have had it before. It's one of the most widely planted varietals in the world. It is French varietal. And it's very diverse because it's incredibly responsive to oak aging. And Chardonnay can kind of run the gamut of styles, everything from what they call a naked Chardonnay, um, which is Chardonnay that has seen no oak aging, just 100% stainless steel, all the way over to those old school California Chardonnays that are big, buttery, butterscotch bombs, kind of full bodied and smooth. Because our winemaker is from Europe, we tend to lean towards more of the French style um, side of life with our Chardonnay. 
It's about a 90% stainless steel to 10% French oak age blend. And blending wine is really a lot of fun. It's kind of the part about winemaking where the science meets the art. Um, and it's a really great opportunity for a winemaker to showcase his experience and style because blending, um, it's all about the balance. You want to take some of those bright um, fruit notes, some of that bright acidity that Chardonnay naturally has and kind of add in some of those subtle oaky characters, a little vanilla, a little bit of almond. So when you smell this wine, you get that fruit up front, some of those beautiful, delicate, appley notes, but also like those hints of vanilla under the peach skin. Um, it's rounded up front, you get more of that zippy, saline driven acidity on the finish. And then that touch of honeycomb, and it just coats your mouth in a beautiful way. And that is all about the balance from the oak with texture. The oak adds the body, the oak adds the honey, the nutty, the vanilla, but we still want to allow the fruit itself to shine through. And that's where you get some of those zippy pineapple, papaya, um, and again, some of those classic hallmark apple notes of Chardonnay. What do y'all think of the Chardonnay? Thumbs up. I like it. Thanks, Lauren. <laughs> All a thumbs up there. It's not like too oaky like some are, and it's not too buttery either. It's like perfect. Like this is the kind of shard I would drink. I don't like either ends of the spectrum, but very good. Thank you. Thank when you. I went, oh, go ahead. So, sorry. When I went to go pick up my tasting pack, I had a, actually a glass of this and I was, I was looking forward to it again. So I agree. It's really good. Thank you. It's it's one of the um, wines we consider our flagship because Chardonnay grows very, very well in our vineyard. It has the most ideal spot at, right at the top of the hill. Again, older vines. Um, and it's just a beautiful wine. And has, Chardonnay is one of my favorite wines to pair with because it does have a little bit more body so it can stand up to some rich, creamy dishes, but it has that zippy acidity that can kind of cut through some of that fat as well. Um, coming up is one of my favorite pairings, a soft shell crab sandwich and Chardonnay. What? It's so good. So something to look forward to this summer while you're hanging out at the shore. Uh, if you're enjoying that Chardonnay, go ahead and just, you know, sip on her, think about it. Um, take your time. Uh, but I'm going to start talking about the Pinot Noir if you're ready. So you can go ahead and pour that Pinot in your glass again see it, swirl it, smell it, sip it, savor it. And again, when you see that um, Pinot Noir, you hold it up to the light. It's translucent. It's this very bright ruby color. It, it shines. Um, and that's a hallmark of Pinot Noir. And Pinot itself is one of the oldest varietals in the world. It dates back to Roman times. It's over 2000 years old. So if you put that into perspective, of other grapes like Cabernet Sauvignon, which is only a couple hundred years old, or hybrids like Traminet or Chamberson that were created in the 60s, like Pinot Noir is an old, old lady. Um, very respected and very difficult to grow. Um, this is actually only our second vintage of Pinot Noir we've ever made. Pinot Noir is known for being a pain in the ass. There is a uh, famous, Russian winemaker, he says, you know, God made Cabernet and the devil made Pinot. Um, but that's why it's so beautiful and seductive um, is because it is a bit more challenging in the vineyard. It has thinner skins, um, tighter clusters. So it makes it a little more susceptible to things like powdery mildew and, and black rot um, and any pests in the vineyard too. It's also very low yielding crop. Um, comparatively, we get only about a half ton um, per acre at harvest versus Cabernet Sauvignon or Merlot, where we're getting about two and a half tons. And that's universal with Pinot Noir. So if you're ever like wondering, like, what's the big deal with Pinot? Why is it so expensive? Well, you have to do a lot for not getting a little. Um, so that's the deal with Pinot Noir. Um, this one grows at our Sandy Vineyard, our Sandy Hill Vineyard in Coatesville. Um, it's called Sandy Hill because there's a lot of sand out there. Um, we have some clay, some loam. Um, we planted those vines in 2013. 
So they're a little bit younger than our Chad's Ford Vineyard. We usually harvest Pinot Noir about late September, early October. And Pinot Noir prefers a cooler climate. So we grow it just a little bit north of our Chad's Ford Vineyard in Coatesville. And it loves it. It is just a little bit cooler up there. Um, and hello, Pennsylvania in general is cooler. So it's actually a wonderful place for this to grow. Um, the Pinot Noir, this beautiful, it's a beautiful nose on this wine. It's kind of earthy. It's got like a little bit of dried rose in there. We use three different Dijon clones. Dijon is the region in Burgundy where Pinot Noir um, is really considered king. If you like red Burgundy, you're drinking Pinot Noir with a little bit of Gamay, but no one cares about that. Um, we grow Dijon clone 115. It's very popular. Um, you'll see it, you know, out in Oregon a lot. Pretty much everyone who grows Pinot grows 115. It's known for extraordinary aromatics. We also grow 667. It has a slightly thicker skin than other clones. So it gives it a nice deep color, more of that tan and more of that structure. And then we also grow 777, which is very rich, very velvety, very complex. Um, and we grow all those together in co-ferment. Um, we made about 282 cases. This is aged in French oak for 12 months. Again, beautiful dried rose petal there. I love the balance of that bright red fruit that just lights up the palate with some of those darker cherry notes, kind of a little bit of cola in there actually. Um, and just very light approachable tannins like Pinot Noir is known for. Um, and again, a very versatile pairing wine, actually Chardonnay and Pinot are probably my go-tos for any pairing um, because Pinot has a higher acid and low at tan and it makes it more um, friendly, food friendly with a lot of different things. You can do duck, um, you can do these, oh man, I made these like mushroom um, stuff with gorgonzola cheese is really beautiful. Pinot Noir loves salmon. Uh, fresh chev is really good. Pork loin, there's so many different things you can do with Pinot Noir. Um, turkey for Thanksgiving during the holidays. So if you're not ever sure like what you should be bringing for dinner, you can bring Pinot or Chardonnay and you're pretty much gonna be covered. And everyone will think you're a genius because it'll taste awesome. How do y'all like that Pinot? Pinot Noir, mid-sized car. Can I ask a question, Rachel? Yeah. What is the thing that people do when they swirl their wine and look for legs? Um, so when they look, thing? they're looking for like the body of the wine, essentially. So wine with legs um, will have a little bit more um, body to it from either the sugar content or the alcohol, really. Um, it really doesn't mean much. People are like, ooh, that wine has nice legs, like <laughs> whatever. Like, it just means like, it's probably like a little, probably, like I said, a little higher alcohol or it has a higher sugar content essentially. And they're just looking for it to kind of like drip down the sides. And it is like, you know, has a higher viscosity and it is pretty, but it doesn't have anything to do with really the quality of the wine per se. It's just kind of more of the style or where it's grown. That's what I like to say to, to look like I know things. I was like, oh yes, it's very, the viscosity on this wine. <laughs> Yeah, legs yes. for days. Me yeah. too. I'm like, this morning, this cab has, a, has nice legs. Right. I but I can say it. And I'm like, oh, well, she ain't no Tina Turner, but she's all right. You know? I mean, if you want to talk about it, you go ahead. Um, anyway, anyone have any other questions? Yeah, That's a good question. The vineyard you said you'd sell to Sandy Hill. Is that on Beacon Light Road? Yeah. Okay. I, yeah, I know that. Okay. I've been seeing that. I wonder who owned it. Yeah, that's ours. Okay. Um, it's actually, it backs up to like a little Amish farm. We don't have a tasting room or anything out there. There's like literally not even a bathroom. So last year when I was pregnant, yeah. <laughs> so I was like, well, I'm just going to dip over there. I, I missed, I missed the, in the chat I saw about holding your nose. I missed that. We, we were having some technical difficulties here. What, what oh. was that? I was just talking about the um, aromatics when they come into play when tasting wine, like you get so, you can experience so much more on your palate if you like really take in the aroma and really smell it. And you can kind of do a little baby experiment where you close your nose and you taste your wine 
and see what you experience versus like really diving in there and smelling it and then tasting your wine. And it's really kind of night and day. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. It's, this is really good, by the way. Thank you. Pinot Noir is a difficult, difficult grape to grow. And um, we're very excited to do it. This is our 2017 vintage. Like I said, our second one. And we're actually going to release our 2018 here probably within the next month. So pretty excited about that guy as well. Super excited to grow and expand into our peanut program. It is kind of one of those things is it's a benchmark for winemakers. It's a little, you know, feather in your cap. If you can do Pinot Noir and you can do it well. Um, again, if you're enjoying that Pinot, I am like not trying to rush you. I just don't want to like, you know, zoom drag you all into uh, oblivion. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, um, you said that you the grape for harvest for this in 2018, and you're going to release it in a couple of months. Is that right? What's that? Yeah. I'm. Um, you said the grapes for this wine were harvested in 2018. Yeah. You're going to, and it's going to be released in a month or so. So is that normal, like three years? Um, for red wine, it's very normal. Um, so from. From the harvest, so from the harvest to the bottle for red wine is for us and in general is typically at least two years. So you, if we pick in like late September, or early October after, you know, fermenting and macerating and all that whole process, the big shebang after like two months, then we're going to throw it in a barrel. And we always personally age our red wines at least 12 months. Um, usually we're doing more around 14 or 15 months and then we bottle it. Well, after you bottle it, this is what they call bottle shock. It's kind of like stirring up a lot of the wine and needs to settle down for a little bit. And we always age, we usually um, bottle age our wine for at least four to six months to kind of let it settle. So when you add up all that time, like it, it usually ends up being at least two years, usually three down the road. Um, so red wine is definitely kind of something you need to think about like far in advance about what you're doing and what you're selling. And cause we got, it got, we're very fortunate, you know, we've been growing, but we kind of got ourselves into like a little red wine crisis. Like two years ago, we're like, Oh God, we're going to run out of red wine <laughs> because white wine is so much quicker. Um, you can ferment it and you bottle it and then you usually release it right next spring so for instance like moscato is like the biggest turnaround we harvest at the first week of september and if we have time we're going to bottle it in december and then she's ready to go like you know whenever the next the last vintage runs out in like february or march it's very like boom 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 where red wine is like hurry up and wait and that's kind of a lot about things about vineyards and winemaking in general like I said we're gonna plant this spring but it's probably gonna be at least three more like five years before we really get grapes out of those vines that we want to work with and probably more like 10 years before we see the fruit we really really would love to see so it's like definitely planning and planting for the future and you know if you're a winemaker or you own a winery it's kind of crazy to think that like you only get one time in a year to do something that you work all year to do. So even if you've been in the business for like 12 or 30 years, you've literally only done that like 20 times in your whole career. Oh. Um, but that, that's are all the chances you get, you know, one, one, one time a year, that's all you get. <laughs> Cause it's not like beer where you can just go out and buy more supplies. Um, anyway, I, I digress, but we can uh, dip into that proprietor reserve 2017 if you all are ready. So our goal with proprietor, um, we generally focus more on like single varietal wines. So we do a couple blends and our goal here with proprietor is to make an exceptional yet very approachable red blend. And we do this one annually. Um, and we take the best fruit of that vintage that really showcases the vineyard in the best possible way. Something that's ageable, you could definitely lay this down, but it is, again, approachable so you can drink it a bit younger. Um, and again, a very exciting um, thing about blending. By combining varietals, a winemaker can really accentuate a wine's virtues 
um, highlight, you know, a touch of spice, add a bit more body, play around with the texture, the tan and the acidity, the alcohol. Um, and it, again, it takes a lot of experience to get that balance just right. And our proprietor blend is different every year. This particular vintage is 50% Cabernet Sauvignon. We planted Cab in 2012 and then some more this past last April, 2020. Um, but Cabernet always brings intensity to a wine. It brings power. It's a little bit weightier. Cabernet Sauvignon grapes have very thick skin. So more tannin, more texture, that ageability factor, um, a chewiness on the back end, some deeper, darker red fruits. This is also 40% Cabernet Franc and Cabernet Franc grows very well here on the East coast. You'll see beautiful styles from the Finger Lakes all the way down to Virginia is getting a lot of, um, you know, a lot of notice with their Cabernet Franc down there. Um, but Cab Franc is, brings more bright red fruit. Think like cranberry and pomegranate, um, some brighter things like that. Bing cherry, a bit brighter acidity and more um, tannin on the front of the palate. And then also this blend has just 10% of carmine. Um, and carmine is an offshoot of the French varietal Carmenier, Carmenere. Um, and carmine is very full bodied, kind of gets that mid palate tannin and adds a lot of earthiness and kind of some dried herb notes there. So like, if you kind of know like each grape and what you're looking for when you blend it, you can find a beautiful balance of all three of them. And what we do is each varietal is harvested separately, vinified separately, aged separately for 12 months in French oak. Then we do the blend and that's aged for oh, just in the aging process has taken a year and a half. And we only made about 124 cases of this vintage um, proprietor is just kind of something a little special that we do. And you'll notice that deeper, darker color, very garnet, very sexy kind of I'm feeling myself color. Um, some dark fruit notes that you smell in the nose, we follow through onto the palate, medium body, definitely more weightier than that Pinot Noir, very balanced with the acidity, the tannins are there, um, they're drying, but they're very finely structured, so they're still smooth and approachable, some nice little baby hints of vanilla, little dried oregano, dried tobacco there on the finish, which I really love. Um, and this is kind of when you get in your pairing where you kind of get the meats, that braised pork shoulder, that grilled T-bone steak, um, some, you know, sharp aged cheddar, uh, camembert is really good with proprietor, blue cheese, yum. Um, some of those bigger kind of bigger boys with the pairing aspect. Uh, how do y'all like the proprietor? I, li I like it best. Yeah. That's yes. your girl so far. Yeah. So love, far. love it. Wonderful. It, it's excellent. It's really, really good. Yep. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's, red, good to, it's good to know that there's good red wines that are local. Cause I feel like I always, I, I prefer red and I have trouble usually finding a red wine at a local winery that is tastes good, you know, for like a novice, you know? Yeah. Red wine is tough um, in a cooler climate region like Pennsylvania, because some of these varietals, especially like Cabernet Sauvignon, it needs a lot more hang time um, during the season. And a lot of wineries here just don't get that. We're actually the southernmost Pennsylvania winery. And a lot of ones, even like an hour north of us, they have to harvest their cab like the first week of October and we're not harvesting ours to like the third or even the last week of October. And even those three weeks make a huge difference in terms of, um, composition for the grapes. We get, you know, it balances out the acidity. Um, we get a little more bricks, which is the sugar. Um, and it makes mm -hmm. kind of a bigger, bolder, richer, um, cooler climate wine than a lot of places around us can do. And also, you know, it's, experience as well. Working with red wine is a whole different animal than working with white wine. Rachel, can you talk about the Cab Franc grape? I don't know a lot about that because I'm like a Cabernet Sauvignon guy, but I know a lot of people like Cab Franc. Yeah. Like, is, that, is that like a from France? and? Yeah, Cabernet Franc is a French varietal. It's actually older than Cabernet Sauvignon and it is Cabernet Sauvignon's daddy. Okay. 
So Cabernet Franc plus Sauvignon Blanc made Cabernet Sauvignon. So you'll kind of get some of those characteristics in a cab, um, but it does tend to be a little bit lighter on the tannins. Like I said, brighter acidity, kind of more bright red fruit. You can, and it has um, a little bit of an herbal note to it, or like that tobacco, some more underripe cab bronchs kind of get a little bit vegetal. Sometimes so you have to be really careful, but <laughs> it needs a shorter <laughs> growing season than Cabernet Sauvignon, which is why it's perfect for a region like ours where it is cooler. We have a shorter season. That's kind of why people started planting it around here in the first place and why it's really popular, but, um, some, you can find some really beautiful styles around here. And usually in France, it's blended. Um, but you can find it single varietally around here. Um, and in California as well. And we, we do a single varietal Cab Franc. If you ever want to come by and try it, it's, it's actually really lovely. Um, our 2014 was banging. Um, and 20, 2016 was really good. We just, we actually, I think we are almost out of it. And then we'll release our new vintage of Cabernet Franc, uh, hopefully this summer, if it's ready. So, so what is the growing season like for France? Like, I would assume being 10 miles away from you, it's, it's June through like August and the September. What what, since it's a shorter season that we have, what's the growing season in France? Is it a couple extra months? Is it one month? Um, it's usually about a month difference. And Pennsylvania is actually often compared to the Loire Valley in France, which actually does grow a lot of Cabernet Franc there as well. Um, so we're very similar in terms of climate and growing season um, to some guys like that. But if, as the further south you go, obviously you're going to get warmer temperatures and kind of um that longer growing season um but when you get into like red wines and stuff too our red wines are kind of more indicative of even like bordeaux because they're they are a cooler climate and if you drink like a bordeaux versus like a california cab they're very very different but they're very very beautiful um bordeaux tends to be like a little bit leaner and more earth driven um, whereas those Cali cabs, they, again, it's very hot over there. So they kind of get some of that and they use American oak. So they get more luscious fruit, um, higher alcohol and kind of some of those chocolate and espresso notes. Um, but yeah, so the, their season, you know, tends to be just a couple weeks longer than ours. But again, in terms of like chemistry, grape chemistry and composition, it, it makes a huge difference in terms of development. And it can go out and it goes either way too. Like when we, when we do harvesting, we got to harvest right away because the grape can have the perfect, the ideal numbers that you're looking for one day. Um, and if you're too late, even the next day, two days later, it's just not right or where you want it to be. It's kind of a very tricky thing to get the timing on. Thank does you. That, that does awesome. that, Thank does you. that answer your question? I hope. Okay. Sure. That was great. Thank you. It was perfect. Yeah. Awesome. Great question. Robin had a question about storing wine. If your basement is not cool enough to store wine, where's a good place to store it? Uh, yeah. If your basement's not cool enough, like, you know, just that a dark cabinet in your kitchen is probably cool. I know my kitchen's usually a little bit cooler. You think like in the summertime, if you're walking on the tile and it's like very cool in front of the fridge, if you have like a cabinet, like somewhere over there, as long as it's dark, um, light is not a wine's friend. High heat is not a wine's friend. Um, and you also want to make sure you store it on their side because you want to keep, make sure that the cork stays moist. If that dries out, you're going to get some oxygen in there and compromise the wine. You'll just end up with vinegar. Um, but also keep in mind, you know, about 90 to 95% of the world's wine production is not meant to age. Actually, it's ready to consume. So you want to make sure that you're saving the appropriate wines. Um, and that's going to depend on the producer, the winemaker's intent and the grape varietal itself. What a wine needs to age, a wine needs tannin and it needs acidity because those things in a wine break down over time. And that's why when you get those older wines, they're smoother. So that's kind of what you're looking for when you're aging wine is to smooth out some of those things that a young, more aggressive wine has. And not every wine is meant to do that. 
So I know that some people are like, oh, I'm going to hold on to this Riesling for like a thousand years. And then you pull it out and you're like, oh, that's gross because it's really you're, gross. You're supposed to drink it. <laughs> um, like within so does, a year. That, does that mean the wine that Patrick and I, Patrick and I got when we got married in our backyard this summer, we put a bottle of red wine in a box mm-hmm. and we're supposed to open it like on our 10 year anniversary or something. <laughs> of course he does that while I'm speaking. He's embarrassing. Come here. <laughs> this is Pepe, who's been watching the whole time, and he's very. Oh my god! Hi, Pepe. He has, so he has a glass of juice for his own. Oh, what a lush. He's ridiculous. <laughs> he doesn't like when I interact with the Zoom, so that's Pepe. Sorry, but oh, does that mean that like red? It, will it be like a surprise when we open our red wine if it's good or if it's it's stored upside down? Yeah, I would. I would. I would store it on its side. Yeah. Um, and then every now and then you're going to want to turn it because that sediment's going to kind of lean on there. You kind of want to start, you know, you can rotate incorporate, it. rotate it, incorporate that back into the wine. Um, as long as you keep it cool, you keep it dark, you keep it on its side, like she might make it. It just depends on, you know, what, what wine it is. And so we'll see in nine years, we'll figure it out. <laughs> yeah. And in nine years, you'll be like, whoa, this is awesome. Or you'll be like, gross. Go out. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. At least you have something to share. I always give my husband a lot of shit because you know how you're supposed to like save the top of your cake in the freezer and like eat it a year later. Well, when we got married, um, I wrapped it up, even like put like, do not eat, put it in the freezer. And he ate it like two days later. That's <laughs> he was awesome. Like, oh. <laughs> was like, I, didn't, I didn't know. I don't, I think he knew, but you know, like. So that's even if your wine makes it 10 years, like one of you might that's get That's true. We have said that, you know, it was funny when, when it was like quarantine time and things were shut down, you couldn't get things. We're like, are we going to break? Like, are we going to open this box of wine right now? But so far it's made it. <laughs> You're so strong. Um, all right. Awesome. Does anyone else have any questions or we can roll right into Moscato? Yeah, Wait. just. Just one more question. I'm just curious. Like we've been to the Finger Lakes a couple of times and you drink these Mm -hmm. reds up there and they're very sweet, but you come to down here to Pennsylvania, especially Southern Pennsylvania, like you just said, Mm -hmm. Uh, specifically there's a winery in Sadsburyville called uh, Black Walnut. Winery. Yeah, yeah. Just yeah and, their, and their wines are very nice and dry and they're, you know, the reds, this, this red's nice and dry. So it is, what is it about that Finger Lake region that makes these reds sweeter than down here? Is it because of shorter growing season or, um, or don't you know? Yes and no. It's, it's honestly, and a lot of it is style choices, you know, like we could make, we make a couple sweet wines. You're about to have one. Um, but a lot of winemakers, you know, there's a huge demand for sweet wine. Sweet wine is very easy to make. Um, it's hard to, mess up it's kind of one of those things is like in for instance in like the beer making world if you ever see like new breweries and all they're making is ipas like they're not a very good brewery because it's hard to mess up an ipa you can just mask it with all those hops um but when you start seeing like pilsners and lagers those are very clean classic styles those are hard to mess up so when you see a winery making a lot of wine typically they're not they don't have a lot of experience um, and sweet wines are easy. They can be very delicious and they're quite popular. So it's kind of one of those things is like, why do the hard thing when you can do the easy thing? Um, because there are wineries up in the Finger Lakes who are making some beautiful Pinot Noirs and some beautiful Cab Francs and some nice drier styles. It's just more of a matter of choice than a matter of can. Is Pinot Noir the most difficult to make? Um, it is one of the most difficult grapes to grow. Um, and because of that, and sometimes it can be a challenge to work with, because like I said, if with the growing season, if you don't get that right balance of pH and bricks, which is the acidity and the sugar, um, you have to make all your fixes in the winery and the more you meddle, the more you, um, have a higher chance of messing it up. So people like us who believe like, very sincerely that great wine is made in the vineyard if you are committed to what you're doing in the ground and you don't really have to do a lot in the vineyard Um, but some things are just naturally difficult 
like Pinot Noir, uh, Zinfandel can be kind of tricky as well. It tends to uh, ripen on the same vine at different times. So you'll have like some really ripe grapes, some underripe grapes, and you're just like, what is happening? Um, there's some things that are early budding, like Viognier, which we grow and in a cool climate like ours. If she's like, you know, rising and shining too early in the spring and you get a late frost, you can lose some buds. Um, so there's, there's things that are, you know, can be difficult about a lot of grapes. There are grapes that are very friendly all around like Merlot. Um, so certain wines have their challenges. Um, and Pinot Noir is definitely challenging. Gotcha. That was a good question. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, all right. If everyone's ready to get your dessert on, this is our Moscato 2020. Um, so let's talk about Moscato for a little bit. Moscato is, well, first of all, the wine you're, the grape you're drinking, they're over. 200 different variations of Moscato and the one we grow is Moscato Canelli or you can call it Moscato Bianco or Moscato Blanc it's it's all the same thing um uh and it is actually one of the oldest uh grape varietals in the world it's it's very it's ancient um and it's originally Greek in origin it was cultivated by the ancient Greeks who planted it along the Mediterranean it kind of spread from there um but today, Moscato, um, it's grown all over the world. It's very famous in the Piedmont region of Italy. Moscato di Asti is kind of like the benchmark um, for white Moscato. And it can be, you know, you always hear that it's going to be sweet, but you can make it in all kinds of styles. It's just, again, a winemaker's decision. Everything from dry, sweet, sparkling, and even dessert wine. Um, what our Moscato is, Moscato itself is a naturally sweet grape. If you go out in the vineyard and you start like, you know, popping grapes, you know, late August, right before the harvest, Moscato is like nature's candy. It is delicious. Um, <laughs> and when we're out there harvesting in it, we're like out there, like picking it and eating it and getting yelled at. We're like, we need to make wine with that. It's just so good. Um, and we like to highlight that natural we like to highlight that natural sweetness. So we don't add any sugar to this wine whatsoever. It all comes from the grape itself. Um, and a lot of uh, winemakers do choose that sugar. And I don't know why, because like I said, it's, it's naturally quite, quite lovely. Um, we grow about four acres of Moscato Canelli. We also grow another type of Moscato, Moscato di Umbergo, which we use in our, it's a black grape Moscato we use in our rosé. Um, but very, very aromatic. Um, the Muscat grape itself has a very high concentration of antioxidants. So it's actually like really good for you. You know, it's, it's sweet, but it's healthy. It's healthy, sweet. Um, and actually it's less sugar than like a Coca-Cola. So like, you know, some people are like, oh, I don't drink wine. And then they just go house a, a Coke or a Pepsi. And you're like, okay, whatever. Um, but if you smell this wine, it's beautiful. It's white nectarine. It's candied peaches. It reminds me of like those little candied peach rings you get at the store or like a white gummy bear it's so beautiful mm -hmm. so fun some stone fruit very fun flavors of more obscure things like lychee um and it's very smooth the sweetness of this wine it's just kind of slides over your palate it's not heavy it's not cloying it has this very beautiful pleasant acidity that kind of balances some of that sweetness out and a kind of a lively effervescence too you'll notice it kind of has a little bubble that lifts you up like right at the end so it's like mm -hmm. lip smacking and refreshing where you're just like oh I'm gonna dive back in there and I always like to kind of put Moscato in front of people who like don't drink sweet wine and then like next thing you know it's gone and you're like boom you just had Moscato this is delicious what? this is very very good it's and it comes so in this good. awesome blue bottle too I mean you can't beat the blue bottle it's, it's just oh blue. yeah the blue bottle is like classic <laughs> moscato packaging and you see a blue bottle and you're just like oh yeah that's my girl it was made for penn state <laughs> right <laughs> i didn't get that bottle in my bag <laughs> just went ahead and picked up the whole thing and like i don't need those minis i'll need a bottle of each please <laughs> 
Um, but it's, it's a beautiful bottle. It's a beautiful label. Actually, all of our labels are made in Italy in Gino's hometown. So, oh, wow. We try to do, you know, everyone we work with from like cheese to, you know, different meats and things like that. We all use local producers, but the one thing Gino wanted to do was, you know, keep making the wines made in his hometown in Italy. Cause he's like, at the end of the day, like that's local to me. That's where I grew up and they're very beautiful, very beautiful bottles. What town is he from in Italy? Um, he's from Abruzzo, from a town I can't pronounce, you know, without sounding like da, 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 da. <laughs> <laughs> something like that. It's, I could spell it for you. I could type it for you. It's probably in the book. Uh, I don't think it's in the book. Um, no. But he's from like the, it's kind of, Abruzzo is Southern Italy. So it's kind of like the lower calf of Italy. Gotcha. Um, and actually he's from there and our assistant winemaker and vineyard managers from there as well. That's cool. Um, so, so I think you said you plant, you have four acres of the Moscato grape. And, and mm -hmm. how much does that equate to in like yield of, of Moscato, like in cases or whatever? Uh, it varies from year to year because, you know, it's essentially farming, but we usually get about like anywhere from 250 to 300 cases. Okay. Um, depending on the year, and that can like it get, like as I said, very extremely widely. Um, in a bad year, like 2018, which was super cold and rainy all year, you probably remember it was horrible. Um, we only produced as a total for our winery about 2,500 cases where we normally produce about 34 to 3,500 cases. So we wow. produced like almost a thousand cases less in a bad year. Um, luckily 2019 was like crazy awesome. And we did like 4,200 cases. So like, that's a wild swing. Like that's an extreme um, circumstance. Usually we're doing about the 3,500, but for the Moscato specifically, it's usually in like the 250 300 range um somewhere in there okay. um and, and you, have prob you have problems with weather with weather with cold and with with moisture how about pests any issues with you know different bugs how about lanternflies are they a problem with your uh with your uh, year lanternfly <laughs> <laughs> um actually you know lantern spotted lanternfly this is actually something we work with Penn State uh, with a lot on our property. They have a lot of like whirly gigs and science things out in the vineyard. Um, we haven't seen too much trouble within our with our vineyard. It's we've actually been quite lucky. There's a lot of vineyards um, and places I know up up north, kind of more like Berks County, Bucks County area. They've had whole vineyards just completely annihilated. What spotted lantern flies do is they attack the trunk of the vine so they swarm it and they basically like leach it from the inside out so they just suck it all dry and then if you go and the vine just crumbles um and young vines in particular are more susceptible to lantern fly where older vines kind of have that thicker skin where they can't kind of dive as deep so lantern fly can be a huge and has been a huge problem um, for the pa viticultural industry in general like I said, we're very lucky in our vineyard. We saw some last year, really for the first time, like, I don't know, there was probably like, so this is 2021, 20, 20 in 2019. Um, there was like a week towards the end of the season where we saw a few, but it was like nothing. And then last year was the first year that we started seeing some, um, and overall our vineyards doing pretty healthy, but there are some places especially like on the edges where they started to swarm but we started doing a lot of um, pest mitigation for that but if you ever see lantern flies you just squish them they're just they're just terrible and they're quick and they just eat everything and even every every kind of farmer has an issue with them they attack orchards and all kinds of crops so they're actually a huge huge issue for our industry um Fortunately, like I said, not, not too much of a problem for us. Uh, there's other things that can cause issues, but not, not, not too many things that can't be wiled away with some magic concoction. We try not to spray. We were actually in 
up until last year, we were four years pesticide free. Um, wow. Did, yeah. But we did have to uh, spray last year for the lantern fly, which sucks. Um, we try to, we plant a lot of cover crops in our vineyard. They aerate the soil naturally. Um, they add nutrients and nitrates to the soil naturally. Um, and some of them are natural fumigators for um, weeds and certain types of insects. So we try to do as much natural processes as we can. And then certain things like an invasive fly from Asia, like there's just nothing else you can do except for protect your crop, you know? So mm -hmm. those, those are some of the issues we have here. The biggest issue here in PA is some of that, if it's the humidity um, and the rot and mildew issues, what we do with that is it's all about canopy management. So if it's really wet and rainy, a vine's like, yeah, I'm going to party. And it's going to focus a lot more on like its leaf production and just kind of get up there and go crazy. But if you do a lot of hedging, a lot of leaf pulling around the cluster, you can kind of get some of that airflow back in there to dry out those clusters. So you can kind of mitigate some of the problems like that. I never realized how complicated <laughs> it was to grow grapes for wine. I mean, it sounds like there's so many factors that come into play. There is a lot going on. Um, yeah. And this is just scratching the surface. Like our, our vineyard manager, David, is absolutely brilliant um, at what he does. And there's from April all the way to, you know, the harvest season, September, October, it is a very, very busy time of year, just keeping it all in line. Wow. So what do y'all think of that Moscato? Pretty Love tasty. Love it. Love it. Delicious. Awesome. Yeah, I'm Mos sad it was so little. <laughs> <laughs> well, we sell we sell Moscato in our tasting more. room. Obviously, uh, we're also at Wegmans statewide in PA. So if you have a um, a Wegmans close by you, we sell our Moscato and a few other wines at Wegmans as well. How about um, Acme? That's down the street. Mm -mm. Nah, not Acme. <laughs> but remember, if you purchase wine in the next seven days and mention this event, that 10% of the proceeds will go to the food pantry at Penn State. Yeah. So there you go. always remember. And just so you guys know what we're doing with that is uh, we're actually purchasing gift cards so students can get more fresh produce and things like that instead of prepackaged things. Good. Thank you. That's a, this is a great event. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you all so much for joining me. You're super fun to chat with.